Welcome to Skeptico. I have an interview coming up in a minute with Kevin Annett. Kevin's a former minister turned whistleblower of a large-scale conspiracy involving church and state in Canada. This is a story that, by the way, has been proven true. It's acknowledged by the Canadian government. And it's also a story, I think, about the nature of evil and how it is often hiding in some of the most unexpected places. Here are some clips from the show. A particular group is targeted. We have those group as less than human, so we can do all sorts of things, all sorts of sexual abuse and rape and torture of the worst kind. We can do experimentation, and ultimately we can do murder. The problem these days with the internet is that people are so overwhelmed by a lot of allegations, but they're never really backed up with hard evidence. The thing that's unique about my story is not only that I'm still alive, but that I've systematically documented this from the very beginning. And the very fact that I've never been sued by anybody is proof right there. Because if this was wrong and I was making it up, they'd have me in court like that to shut me down, right? Most people don't find anything normal about that. Taking these kids, forcing them to into these schools, which are death camps, and then knowing that significant emotional kids are going to be abused physically, sexually raped, you know, then that's not normal. Well, I'll give you an example. Um, one of the first forums we held in Vancouver, a white woman came and she was almost the only white person there. It was almost all native survivors of these death camps. And her name was Mary McFarlane. And she described how she worked in the Alberni residential school and she got fired because one day she found a matron taking a piano leg and beating a little Indian girl to death with it. And so Marion knocks out the woman doing that. She defends the little Indian girl. John Andrews, the principal, fires her for doing that. And he says, anything that happened to that little squaw would have been better than losing that woman because she plays the organ in church on Sunday. She talked about how they're now kind of even co-opting the digging up of these mass grave sites, which are really crime scenes, but they're somehow recasting this as just a way of, oh yeah, you know, some bad things did happen there and some kids got hurt. And that's really sorry that they died on those farm implements and we'll just move all the evidence over here. Well, you know, the best example of that is when we did the dig, the only dig that's ever happened at a mass grave site at a residential school, we, I was invited by the Grand River Mohawks in Ontario to come and dig at the site of the oldest residential school. It's called the Mohawk School, Anglican Church, Church of England, around it. Um, and, and let's just be clear, they, they wanted you to dig because they felt that they knew. They knew. Yeah. Well, they saw it. I mean, we, I met Gerono Mohenry, uh, Leona Moses, other people who had dug the graves and put their fellow students in the ground. We went over, we got experts, we got ground penetrating radar, we had two forensic uh, specialists coming in. Archaeologists did, did the dig within an hour. We found bones and buttons wrapped in the roots of the tree because they used to plant trees on top of the graves. In public relations, they call it the inoculation strategy. You inoculate people with an idea and then dump, they get so used to hearing it that they're, they're, they're inoculated against coming to a conclusion and being shocked and saying, wait a minute, what's going on? It's a gradual process of normalizing a, a horrible thing. And that's how they, one of the ways they do it, right? What was it like sitting with and experiencing the pain of others? Because I think that's something else that if we're really going to be honest, most of us shield ourselves from. And you didn't. When I was in the church and people would get up and speak from the pulpit, it shocked me, but it didn't rock my world yet because it was still abstract. It's only when I lost my own children and I saw how the church brutally took my children from me, then I began to be open to the fact that they may have hurt other children because I saw what they did to my own children and me. So you need a personal experience to hang it on, right? And what about beyond that? Because you've gone much further. I mentioned satanic ritual abuse, which immediately is gonna shut a lot of people down because they've been conditioned to think that that can't possibly be true. It's satanic panic. It's all the rest of this stuff that if anyone investigates, they find that it's, that's not the case, that it is a reality. How do you get there? You haven't experienced that. Well, I've had experience when I was a minister in Port Alberni, I took part in an exorcism 
and then I conducted other ones, I came face to face with something. And it's very difficult to try to put into words, but it confirmed me with the reality of this, this evil. Do you believe that people have spiritually transformative experiences? And do you believe that those spiritually transformative experiences can be through Christ? Is that real? I can't, well, I can't judge whether it's real or not. I can't look into another person's soul and say, you know, I know what they're going through. I don't have the religious belief that one person can do that for another. But put it this way, Frederick Douglass, the slave, he, he led the abolitionist movement. He, he, in his biography, he describes how his slave master had a religious conversion, became a Methodist, born again Methodist. So he expected the slave master to then release all the slaves. And no, he became even more brutal because he had God on his side. And if you have a genuine spiritual thing, why do you need a church? Can both be true? Can, I mean, look, I'm not a Christian. <laughs> I'm not religious. So I'm kind of playing devil's advocate here. I've been a minister. I know exactly what you're talking about. The majority of my parishioners were there because it's a social club. Just a spiritual calling is very personal and it, it's not part of a group. Quakers have a saying, God gets lost in a crowd. And I think that that's true. But it boils down to a simple moral and legal fact that if you're part of an institution that's committing crime, it doesn't matter what your spiritual beliefs are. You're part of a crime. You're putting money in a collection plate. You're associated with them. You're an accessory to a crime. So we say to people, what does that have to do with the spiritual calling? You can't be part of that if you're a moral person. Forget about spirituality. Let's just talk about morality and ethics. Are you really going to be associated with, with these churches that have centuries of blood on their hands and they're still doing these crimes? I mean, I don't think any moral person would do that. And so to me, it boils down to that, not spirituality. Right? Ultimately, our minds can deceive us because they're conditioned, they're programmed, they're influenced, but our heart mind doesn't. That consciousness within our own heart and soul. I say to people, the last thing you want to do is isolate in a room, isolate in a life, thinking that a counselor is going to help you. You know, when I, I tell that famous story of, of William Coombs, um, the native guy who, when we occupied the church, he was there with us, even though it was torture. Like he heard the chant sound of a church bell, he'd start getting sick because of the way he'd been tortured in these places. Yet there he is in church with us the day we occupied it. And I said, William, how could, and he was really happy. He was handing out flyers to people. And he had no fear. He wasn't afraid of these priests. And he said, I didn't want to let you guys down. I didn't want to be left out. Right? Now that, that love, that desire to be with us, we did that. We helped heal him that day, not some counselor, but all of us together showing we're not afraid of these people. We're not afraid of the truth. We're going to stand here and help and love each other in practice, right, where it counts. And that he stopped drinking that week. That's bloody miracle, you know, if you knew his situation. Um, but we did that miracle together. And that's, to me, I, you, you reconnect with that common blood heartbeat. And, uh, and you find that in nature everywhere. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. At this point, most of us are at least a little bit tired of stories about social injustice. But one of the unfortunate consequences of the social justice warrior thing is the proportionality of it. Take, for example, today's guest. In 1994, as a minister of United Church in British Columbia, Kevin Annette walked into what he probably thought was his dream job. Now, that job turned into a nightmare in a 25-year ordeal as he became a whistleblower of some of the most horrific Holocaust-level crimes in Canada's history. And worse yet, chances are you've never even heard about any of them. You know, on this show, I'm always drawn to stories where one person can make a monumental difference. And Kevin Annette is certainly one of those people. Besides being an award-winning journalist and filmmaker, he's also become a continuous voice for justice in a very important way. And I think as we were just chatting about a minute ago, 
his story is critical to understanding our culture in general. So it's a bit of a long introduction there, but Kevin, it is a great pleasure to have you on Skeptico, and thanks so much for joining me. Thank you, Alex. I appreciate the, the time to be able to do so. So, Kevin, of course, uh, we're going to talk about your books. I've just popped one of them up here, Murder by Decree, and people can also check out murderbydecree.com, which stays up to date on a lot of things that are going on in your world. But, you know, I think the easiest place to start is this history, the history of what happened. I have a short clip I'm going to play from the movie. I want to let people know this movie, Unrepentant, is available on YouTube. Let me play this clip. Unrepentant reveals Canada's darkest secret, the deliberate extermination of indigenous peoples and the theft of their land under the guise of religion. This never-before-told tale is seen through the eyes of a former minister who blew the whistle on his own church after he learned of its murder of thousands of children in its Indian residential schools. What happened to the thousands of children who died or disappeared while in Canada's Indian residential schools? Why have Canada and the churches responsible for their fate refused to say what happened to them and stayed silent in the face of hundreds of eyewitnesses who claim seeing murders and experiencing obscene tortures in these schools? So, Kevin, that's... Again, a very brief clip from the movie. Please start and tell us the story just as you have told us. At this point, Kevin has a lot of other interesting shit to say, and we'll hear about it in just a minute. So many times from the beginning. Well, there's a lot. Uh, I think I'll touch on on the main points that are relevant to the way you you set up the interview. Um, I was like a lot of Canadians, even though I was from a young age, we were involved in politics and, and social justice issues and all that. Um, I was still completely ignorant of our own genocide in our backyard. And that's not accidental. The histories have been wiped clean. It resides only in the memory of the survivors. And I began to meet some of them. I was ordained in the United Church when I, in 1990. Uh, by 92, my young family and I were in Port Alberni, which is right on the west coast of Canada, on Vancouver Island. And um, I'll never forget the first time anyone told me about this. It was the first week I was on the job and I was hired to go out and kind of bring new people into the church because it was a dying congregation, St. Andrew's United Church. And um, the, uh, I got a call from uh, a native guy called Danny Gus. He wanted to get married. I went out to talk to him. I didn't know his home was right next to the former, what they call residential schools. These were internment camps. And Can I just interject? At, at this time, you don't you don't know any of that stuff. You don't know that no. the, the the schools are internment camps. You don't know that which you later document very carefully in in proceedings that you pr uh, submit to court that the death rate is what you said. Fifty percent don't come back, and then through testimony, you find that they are being murdered and they're being tortured and experimented upon and all the stuff you hear about like Holocaust level kind of stuff. Right. 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 And so, no, I didn't even know about the existence of these places. Right. Um, Danny Gus said, uh, you know, I asked him why there were no Indians in any of the churches kind of naively, like, you know, a third of the population is native. You don't see them working anywhere. And like, why aren't, why isn't there that contact? He didn't say anything for a long time. He was looking out the window at the former school and uh, because the buildings are still standing there. And uh, finally he said, they killed my best friend in that school and beat him to death. And then they buried him in the hell out back. That's why they don't want us in their churches. And so, I mean, that blew my mind. I just kind of, now I told somebody in the church that right away. And they said, we don't believe them. Uh, they're just mad at us for taking their land. They're just making all this stuff up. Because at that point, this was uh, summer of 92, when I first started working there. Um, there had been no court cases. The court cases didn't start for four years later. So the churches were free to say, oh, no, it's all made up, right? Uh, they only started talking, admitting stuff when they were getting sued. They kept it covered up before them, right? So that led me down the trail. And, I mean, and I those started... lawsuits, you are instrumental to opening up the possibility to people even having those lawsuits. And I go back to even your story. I want to go back to that. When this guy says, this human being, this fellow potential member of the congregation says, I want you to marry me, but you, the church was responsible for murdering. 
one of the reasons we can ignore this guy is because he's Indian, right? Because if it's a, a white well, person yeah. that says that, there, there's, we, le we at least have to pause. But in, in this case, we can just kind of dismiss it. It's an Indian. So, you know, they make stuff up. It, it's, that's been part of the problem here is that because it seems to be occurring to a foreign group, most white people can't relate to it. Even though this was happening and still today happens to lots of white children too, you know, the same system exactly. of culture killing all of this institutionalized murder. I mean, it's going on, but the natives were like the canary in the mine shaft. A lot of the stuff that's happening now to all of us was tested out on them first. And that's another thing I found out. But yeah, you're quite right. The first lawsuit began in uh, actually right after I got fired, because the short story here is that I started bringing Native people in. They began to share more stories. Uh, in one of my latest books, uh, this at the mouth of a cannon, I, you can get this on Amazon. Um, I talk about how the issue that actually got me fired was not just letting Natives speak from the pulpit about these crimes in the residential schools, which I did, but um, I found out that the missionaries of my former church had grabbed all this native land originally, I mean, given to it by the British crown, right? Other people's land. Then later they sold it off for a lot of money to like logging companies, uh, all sorts of big money involved, right? And I wrote a letter about that and I was out on my can immediately because you know, you, you, you're stepping on the big toes, money toes behind the church. But um, after that, within a half a year of me getting fired, these lawsuits began. And that's when the church really moved on me because I was sharing information with the lawyers, hard evidence from that had been given to me that, yeah, th this wasn't just rape and, and beatings. This was killings, medical experimentation, mass murder. Um, that's now being admitted to some degree, you know? So one thing led to another, right? Yeah. There's so many things to, to touch on there. I, I kind of hardly know where to begin. I do want to emphasize the fact that as we talk about this, there's, going to be a certain casualness to the conversation that is going to throw people off. I mean, we're talking about, again, a Holocaust level. And I like to throw that term out there because that's really what we're talking about. And if we, when we put it in that context, it upsets people. But that's truly, in every respect, uh, you know, a, a particular group is targeted. We have those group as less than human, so we can do all sorts of things all sorts of sexual abuse and, and, and rape and torture of the worst kind. We can do experimentation and ultimately we can do murder. And then this thing gets so deep. And when we talk about being acknowledged, and I put that in quotes, because that's a whole other story too. And it speaks to how conspiracies happen and how part of the process is to kind of get in front of the story and meld the story and soften the story and change the story. And you've seen that and experienced that as well. And then the other thing I thought we might talk about so that people can wrap their heads around what really happened is that what you just touched on, it's good for business. It's not good for business to have any population that you need to support or provide services for. The less people you can provide services for, kind of the better it is for your business, really. And the, but the other side of that that I think we want to touch on is that there's an evil to this that goes even beyond just the usual money grubbing, how can I kind of make more money for myself, human greed kind of factor. Do you want to speak to any of those topics? Well, yeah, there's a lot there, but um, what I'll do is I'll take it piece by piece here. Um, the problem these days with the internet is that people are so overwhelmed by a lot of allegations, but they're never really backed up with hard evidence. The thing that's unique about my story is not only that I'm still alive, but that I've systematically documented this from the very beginning. And the very fact that I've never been sued by anybody is proof right there. Because if this was wrong and I was making it up, they'd have me in court like that to shut me down, right? They'd never contested it. Even when we went and set up a common law court in Europe and put the Pope and Queen Elizabeth on trial, even then they didn't dispute it because I knew it was all true. What you have to do is, um, it's like when I, when I was in law school for a year, before I dropped out, uh, one thing I, I learned, you know, they told me in legal process class, when you're in court, if the evidence is on your side, you argue the evidence. But if the evidence goes against you, attack the witnesses. Well, you, you know, let me interject something. The first thing 
I always do when I have a guest on the show, I, I usually do, because sometimes I've failed at my own expense when I haven't done this, is I always go and look at the other side. So I could go and look at Kevin Annette Liar, because that comes up all the time. <laughs> Kevin Annette you. Liar, you know? And I went and looked at that data because it, it reveals so much. It takes about five minutes of Kevin Annette Liar stuff to just see how flimsy all those arguments are. And as, as you just pointed out, one thing that you do, Kevin, you not only document that you name names, and we're going to play a couple of clips later. You say, this yeah. Canadian Monty, Monty did this. And you immediately go, well, if that's not true, then there's going to be a lawsuit. And then you name another person. You say, if that's not true, there's going to be a lawsuit. I talk about this in my whistleblower manual. Uh, there, I call them the three Ds. If you're a whistleblower, they go after you with deny, discredit, and distract. They have to deny everything. They've got to distract the issue away from the evidence, and they've got to discredit the person saying it. But they can never use the evidence, so they always focus on the, on the person and try to just make people afraid of them. And I say, look, it's not about me. Just go to murderbydecree.com. Look at the hard evidence. Look at the 50% death rate over half a century. That's an issue never, no one in Canada ever addresses, the media, government, churches, anyone, because they know there's proof right there. Why would the children in 1903 be dying at the same death rate that they are in 1952, half a century later? Unless it's deliberate, because if you've got a high death rate from, from communicable disease, you, you fix the situation, the death rate comes down. But no, they're taking the healthy children, putting them in with the sick and letting them die off. They did that 50 years apart. That's an intent to wipe out children. So no one ever addresses that. They just say, oh, Kevin's making it up. Well, how can I? And in here, we show documents from the Dr. Peter Bryce who documents it. He documents that half the children are dead after less than a year. And, and that's the same figure decades later. So... You know, I mean, that right there, they can't refute it. So they got to just distract from it. They got to pe get people forgetting those things. You'll never see that reference anywhere in a Canadian curriculum and a, a movie on the residential schools. The only people talking about it is the movement we started, right? True enough. And uh, if, again, I, I, I just can't say enough that there's no way we can cover the story, the evidence that Kevin and his group and other people who've joined his cause have amassed in this show. But if you go to, if you read his book, and if you go to Murder by Decree, where he updates this stuff, you will see documents that he's submitted to court that prove this, the application for admission or something like that into these residential schools that clearly states some of these things. But I want to come back and I want to talk about this whistleblower thing that you just brought up, because I think whistleblowing is misunderstood. It's gone from this very kind of positive social change. In your story, you talked about at the very beginning when you got fired, but that process actually took a while, right? Well, they, um, you see, you don't see yourself as a whistleblower at first. I mean, I, again, naivety has a place because if we were really aware of what we're up against, we'd never do this stuff. Like simple self-protection, concern about our children would pull back. So it has a place. Our ignorance can be a great virtue in the long run. It's like uh, that yin yang. There's, there's, you know, the light and the shadow, right? Um, but anyway, um, they tried the, uh, you know, the velvet glove of, uh, and the hammer approach. First, they uh, they said, Kevin, you can uh, stay in the church, but you've got to have psychiatric evaluation and be retrained. Okay. Um, so the implication is if I went along with that, I would be admitting that I'm kind of crazy to have even mentioned these things. That way they're all off the hook. This is just Kevin's imagination. Uh, children never died. It was just Kevin imagining these things. So I said no to that. I said, no, there's no basis for a psych exam. And so at that point they brought the hammer down. They went to my wife. They said, we're never going to let him work again. And that first thing you do, you go to the wife and the people around this guy and take him out and take away any possible support. They got my wife to, uh, secretly plan a divorce against me. They, she eventually got the children, my two daughters. Uh, it's interesting because they assured her that she would get the children in family court, which means they had the collusion of the family court system in British Columbia. Because at that point, he realized, well, then we're up against the crown here, the government. Like we're not, it isn't just some United Church people scared about 
their dirty laundry coming out. There was a whole, I went up against the empire almost immediately. And that was proof of that, right? Because um, the government and the church, they were all involved in these crimes. And so I started getting late night visits from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, you know, asking, just harassment, you know. Um, I wasn't allowed to work anywhere. I went into poverty. I lost my kids. I tried retraining at the university and, and they blocked my funding there. I mean, it, it went on and on like that, right? Yeah, hold on, because there's a lot to this story. I want to know if we can drill into this a little bit. You, you're doing, to put it in Christian terms, you're doing God's work. You're coming serving a population. What is it? I want to know what this is like for you because you had to feel like you were following your calling. You were, you were bringing these people up, in, reintroducing them to the church. What a wonderful thing. People who've been alienated from the church and you're bringing them back in. You have yeah, to. Well, that's feel why it didn't make sense because if they, if they were smart, if they were smart, they would have offered me another job. They wouldn't have come down on me because the more they came down on me, the more I got educated. And the more I didn't stop, because once it, you take away, you see, this is the big mistake tyrants always make. They think if we crush the people, we're going to win. The more you try to crush somebody, most people will be taken out. But there's a small minority who learn and who get tougher and who become veterans and say, well, no, I've lost my children. I've lost, what else can I lose? What else? It doesn't matter. Do whatever you want to me. I'm not stopping now. Um, Sun Tzu talks about that in The Art of War. He says, never force your enemy into an inescapable situation because then they get a real resolve. They know they're going to die. They'll fight to the death at that point, which is what I'm doing. I, I get that. I get that. And I'm totally blown away that, that you took that path because very few people take that path. And, and most people find a way to jump out of the plane, you know, way yeah. sooner than that. But I, I just do want to go back to that for one more minute because I want to know, uh, we want to talk about the spiritual part of this and the, the deeper spiritual part. And I want to know for you as a Christian, as a minister, as a, a reverend, you know, a leader of the church, you're doing the right thing in, if, through all your training and through your deep personal beliefs, I have to believe at this point. And you're bringing these people back to church. You're bringing these people back to Christ for whatever that means. Let's just do it. You're setting up a food bank to serve these people. You're doing all the things you're supposed to do. And yet, and, and then when these people come up and they start talking from the pulpit, you, you, your heart has to sink every time you hear these stories and you go, and you're wrestling with how has my church been complicit in this? What is that transformation process like before they even come with the velvet fist? You know, I mean, yeah, but I, I wasn't really. I mean, even then as a minister, I knew the history of Christianity, okay? Even if people like to ignore it. I knew that, that I mean, just the Catholic Church alone has been responsible for more killing in history than any institution. So I knew it was uh, uh, not even just a dichotomy, it was a lie. There's nothing more of a lie than organized religion because it's saying one thing on Sunday and doing the exact opposite during the week. And um, I learned quickly that the church is, is about big money. Um, it's about, I mean, Every church in, that I've encountered, if you scratch beneath the surface, you find they're all involved in money laundering, usually for organized crime. They have a tax exempt status. Uh, they've, they're all involved in child trafficking and child abuse. It's rampant. I get calls every week from people in the Mormon church, uh, the, um, not just all the mainstream churches, Jehovah's Witnesses. It's, it's, and religion provides a great cover for crime because people think, oh, that's the last place it's going to go on. They're all moral people, aren't they? No, it's the opposite. So I had to learn all that on the ground, and I'm glad I learned it. I, I wouldn't go back to that state of ignorance for anything, right? Fair enough. I'll tell you what, I did want to play uh, another clip for folks. At the time this Mountie threatened me, uh, Peter Montague, he's head of E-Division, uh, secret ops, they call it, black ops, whatever. Um, he actually... These guys are funny, you know, because they think they're God and they can't be touched, so they like to boast to you about what they're going to do to you and what they can do and everything. So Montague said to me that um, you're never, you're not only never going to work in this country again, but nobody's ever going to know, no one's going to remember your name after 10 years. They don't talk about murder, rape, torture. They talk about abuse and being estranged from their families and, you know, all the soft language. Um, uh, after that date, my name was swabbed out of the media. You never see it again. I was like in apartheid South Africa, they, when you're banned, your name could never be mentioned in the media. It's why the 
South Africans came to Canada to set up their apartheid laws. They just studied what we did on the Indian reservations and with the Indian Act and modeled the apartheid laws on, on Canada. Okay, there's, there's a lot there to unpack. I want to let people know that that is uh, about an hour-long interview you have available on YouTube. Again, excellent. If you want to check it out, uh, please do. Kevin just talks very matter-of-factly, but again, with a ton of evidence to back up what he's saying. But do you want to speak to the threats, the bullet? I understand there is a bullet left on your like kitchen table. You were directly threatened that you'd be killed. I mean, talk about that. Well, I mean, there've been a lot of things. I mean, and it's, it varies. It usually increases when I start getting more public exposure. When we expanded to Europe and began to work there and, and help bring down Pope Benedict in 2013, then it really intensified, right? And then it was physical assault. It was people disappearing who I was working with. Uh, the whole gamut, you know, like uh, they can't strike at somebody with a lot of light on them. Anybody who's got a lot of exposure, um, they tend to just hit the people around them. And um, so it kind of goes up and down a lot, but the reality is if you're gonna kill somebody, you'll do it. You don't send them a death threat. If you're gonna sue them, you'll do it. You won't say, I'm gonna sue you, right? I mean, a lot of this is designed to scare and intimidate people. Um, and so I don't even think about it anymore. I know that uh, a lot of people who are even in the system agree with me. I've had cops, people in the churches, they all say, yeah, it's good this is coming out, but I can't be associated with it, right? I'm worried about my pension or whatever, right? So it, what, the impact we have is much greater than we realize. Uh, that's why they constantly need us to back up. They try to scare us into backing off all the time. And if you don't, the system is remarkably fragile and vulnerable, and you just have to keep pushing. And we found that we occupied these churches, and um, once we started going in on Sunday morning and uh, occupying them and, and talking about the dead children, within a couple of weeks, the government started talking about issuing apologies. The, the church has collapsed. You know, we, we can't a coup against them in every way just by going in threatening what they love. That's what Sun Tzu says in The Art of War. It doesn't matter how small you are. If you threaten what a larger enemy loves and, and holds dear, their strength is nullified and they have to respond to what you're doing. And that's exactly, that was borne out and everything. There was maybe two dozen of us across the country and we forced out this truth, right? So it's, uh, it, it's a real lesson for us. And the, the powers that be or the powers that pretend to be uh, don't want us to learn that lesson because there's a great strength in the people. Uh, sleeping giant, if we awaken to our real power, this shit is gone. I mean, we're, we can just change the world tomorrow if we woke up to that, right? Maybe. <laughs> Let's talk some more about that. I'll tell you where uh, I, I want to go next, and then I'll let you maybe pick after that. But the topic of conspiracy is always interesting to me, and it comes up a lot on this show. I'm amazed that so many people really don't believe that conspiracies of this scale can even happen. They just say that one of their first things is, I don't believe it because I don't think it could exist. So I think one of the right. things that you stand witness to <laughs> is that, yeah, you can have these huge, large-scale conspiracies involving the highest levels of government, involving uh, the inner workings of these religious institutions that will have the, 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 almost the ultimate power inside our culture, and they do exist. So do you want to speak to conspiracy? Well, you know, it's a funny word because it's become a pejorative kind of term, but under the law, conspiracy is three or more people gathering and intending to cause a crime. It's a term, criminal conspiracy, you know, and, and so it's not some imagined thing, right? Um, the way it operates in practice is the, the people with money and power don't have to conspire. They just make arrangements, right? We don't know about those arrangements and we learn about them and our whole world is blown away because all we live, um, we're, everything is so normalized. The crime is so normal to us that it doesn't seem like a crime. What do you mean? And, what does that mean to you in this case? Because no, most, people, most people don't think what you're exposing. They wouldn't find anything normal about that. Taking these kids, put it, forcing them to into these schools, which are death camps. They know that there are going to that a significant portion of those kids are going to die, and then knowing that a significant portion of those kids are going to be abused physically, sexually raped. You know, 
then that's not normal. Well, I'll give you an example. Um, one of the first forums we held in Vancouver, a white woman came and she was almost the only white person there. It was almost all native survivors of these death camps. And her name was Marion McFarlane. And she described how she worked in the Alberni Residential School. And she got fired because one day she found a matron taking a piano leg and beating a little Indian girl to death with it. And so Marion knocks out the woman doing that. She defends the little Indian girl. John Andrews, the principal, fires her for doing that. And he says, anything that happened to that little squaw would have been better than losing that woman because she plays the organ in church on Sunday. We can't lose that. So there's a hierarchy of, in anybody's mind, okay, well, so a little Indian kid dies. I mean, they seem kind of odd anyway. They're like different, they, you know, so, but death is abstract, but we can't not have an organist on Sunday because that's something we know. We, need, we, we want pleasant music on Sunday, right? So we act, we all have a low, small little circle of experience. And when you say death and torture, it's outside that by and large, unless you're a victim yourself. And then you just don't want to talk about it and you want to pretend your life is fine. Um, but if, if that is outside your circle of experience, it's all abstract. It's, it's not, there's no reference point, right? And that's why you've got to bring it in. We stopped talking about Aboriginal children and we started just saying children. That's something people can relate to. Okay, dead children. Um, it, that you can relate to it because there's nothing more horrible than the idea of losing your own child, right? And having gone through that myself, lost contact with my own children, when I spoke in a healing circle, I spoke from my heart, my own pain. And that's why people trusted me because it's something they could relate to. But most of the stuff, genocide, it's just a word. It doesn't mean anything to anyone until you give a specific example. This child was tortured to death on this date and buried in this hole by this person, right? And that's what we've been saying from the very beginning in all our work. Here are the details of how it happened. Here's why it happened. It came out of a system that's been doing that for centuries, right? And it's normal in our culture to do that. Genocide is a normal tool of church and state. It has been for centuries. Read the and history, right? The other thing I thought we might touch on, because I think you, again, provide witness to this, is some of the tricks of the trade in terms of how these conspiracies are not just perpetuated, but then covered up. And that's work that you continue to do to this day. I love the, you know, from the Simpsons, you know, when... Um, Chief Wiggum says, we're going we're gonna to appoint a blue ribbon committee to look into this. And Homer says, well, blue ribbon, you can't get better than that. And that's like a little trick of the trade. It's so obvious at this point. It's been done over and over again. The Warren Commission, the 9-11 Commission here in the States. But how did it operate for you and uh, in, in this work that you were doing in Canada, this blue ribbon commission? Well, that, you know, that's the purpose of any so-called commission of inquiry to control the narrative. They call it in public relations. You have to move in quickly, control the narrative, tell the story from your point of view. And uh, they, they, when I began to publish this stuff, they, they first they denied it. And then when the lawsuits began, they said, okay, it happened, but it wasn't intentional. We were just trying to help these poor little kids and there were excesses and, you know, a few children were harmed and now we're going to apologize and give money. But if you get the money, there's a gag order attached to it. So if you're a native person, uh, you can't ever talk about it again. It's just another way to gag people. So um, it went through various stages. And now it's got to the point where on June 4th, the prime minister, Justin Trudeau, even admitted genocide happened. He said that. Yes, it was genocide. Well, now they're saying thousands of children died. So they're, 20 years later, they're saying everything I did. But they're still saying Kevin Ann is making it all up, even though they're, they're repeating it. So it's, it's crazy, you know, when you look at it, the way it plays out in practice. But um, don't forget they're able to say that now because they've legally indemnified everybody. And that's what they do. While they're talking all the correct, politically correct talk, they're making sure that nobody can get sued. Uh, the churches won't lose their uh, insurance coverage, which is what their main concern was, uh, that, the, you know, they'd... they'd have all their properties seized in a court case or whatever. That was their only real concern, losing money. Um, and, um, and so the, the perpetrators indemnify themselves and then they use all the right language and they silence everybody in the same at the same time. So at the end of the day, they, George Orwell in 1984 called the erase the erasure. Even the process of cover-up is erased and they've rewritten history. And now everyone in Canada thinks, 
oh yeah, well, the government and churches did the right thing and they admitted this stuff and now everybody's happy, right? They don't know anything about the real history or the campaign we, we waged to force this out, right? It's being effectively erased. So here's an example of it. Yeah, that, that image you got. Let's play this clip uh, from a video that you just recently released on YouTube. And again, I don't know if we can get people there, but there's a depth to this that is just, <laughs> we'll talk about. Hello, this is Kevin Annett. We're at the University of British Columbia campus, and I'm going to demonstrate a, a case in point of the Canadian cover-up of genocide. Here we have, off to our left, the Kerner Library, where since 1996 I uncovered the hard evidence of genocide in Canada, the documentation. Right down in this basement area, the microfilmed archives of the Department of Indian Affairs showing evidence of mass deaths in residential schools, sterilization programs, crimes against humanity discovered right there, year after year. Now look what the perpetrators of that crime have just created, right next door. The Indian Residential School History and Dialogue Center. Now what's interesting is I went in there and I asked around to see what evidence they had about residential schools, and guess what? In this government and church funded cover-up, building, they have nothing of the evidence that's right next door here in Kerner Library. None of the records at murderbydecree.com, not a single one that's just 50 feet away, found its way into the Indian Residential School History and Dialogue Center. Gee, now that's not because the serial killer appointed the jury by any chance, did they? I remember asking a reporter, if you're a serial killer, would you get to appoint your own judge and jury? Because that's what's happened with the TRC. The, the church has got to nominate who the TRC commissioners were. The Privy Council Office approved it. These are the very people that did the crime doing the investigation into themselves. Powerful stuff there. Do you want to elaborate? Well, I mean, that's the norm in Canada. And what, you know, the double thing going on is that people can look at that and go, Oh, well, that's good. And I said, no, it, it's an obvious cover up. They're putting out their own version and ignoring the hard evidence and destroying the evidence. As a matter of fact, an example of that is the Supreme Court in Canada two years ago ruled that any evidence coming out of a residential school could be destroyed. Like a court saying you can destroy evidence from a crime scene. Right. It's like it's mind boggling what these people get away with and yet thinking they're doing the right thing, you know. Well, I was listening to your radio show podcast recently, and you were documenting another case of that. And again, for people like me who are truly are, are trying to understand this stuff at a deeper level and its broader implications for conspiracy and truth finding, but you talked about how they're now kind of even co-opting the digging up of these mass grave sites, which are really crime scenes, but they're somehow recasting this as just a way of, oh yeah, you know, some bad things did happen there and some kids got hurt. And that's really sorry that they died on those farm implements and we'll just move all the evidence over here. Well, you know, the best example of that is when we did the dig, the only dig that's ever happened at a mass grave site at a residential school, we, I was invited by the Grand River Mohawks in Ontario to come and dig at the site of the oldest residential school. It's called the Mohawk School, Anglican Church, Church of England ran it. Um, and, and let's just be clear, they, they wanted you to dig because they felt that they knew, they knew yeah. that oh, their well, ancestors a, were, that their I'm children not, were buried there. Well, they saw it. I mean, we, I met Toronto Mohenry, uh, Leona Moses, other people who had dug the graves and put their fellow students in the ground. We went over, we got experts, we got ground penetrating radar, we had two forensic uh, specialists coming in. Archaeologists did, did the dig within an hour. We found bones and buttons wrapped in the roots of the tree because they used to plant trees on top of the graves to hide the remains. These were buttons from before World War II, like they weren't plastic, they were earlier versions of buttons. We had the bones analyzed at the Smithsonian Institute. Sure enough, it was a um, knee socket of a young girl, maybe five. No media in Canada were reported. The first evidence of, of uncovering the remains of 
children at a residential school was totally censored out of the media. One newspaper reported the Mohawk Community Newspaper in Brantford, Ontario. That's it. After that, they then moved in. They all they got the, the government funded chiefs to destroy the site, to silence everybody, to, to pay off or, or scare off the elders who had invited me. The whole thing. That was in early 2012. But all of that evidence we used in the common law court case in Europe to help indict these people and force Ratzinger to resign and all this other stuff. In public relations, they call it the inoculation strategy. You inoculate people with an idea and then dump, they get so used to hearing it that they're, they're, they're inoculated against coming to a conclusion and being shocked and saying, wait a minute, what's going on? It's a gradual process of normalizing a, a horrible thing. And that's how they, one of the ways they do it, right? Exactly. That's very well said. Precisely what we're seeing here. And we'll see over and over again when we talk about conspiracy, because it's, it is one of the tried and true tricks of the trade. You're desensitizing people from it. Where should we go next? There's a lot of topics that we could potentially talk about. Is there anything up there that you'd like to speak to next, Kevin? Well, it's all relevant. I mean, uh, I, I think it's good to, uh, I'm actually doing a, a, doc, a sequel to our documentary film, Unrepentant, um, which I didn't mention. We, we, uh, we released this film in 2007 and it really is what forced the apology in Canada because members of parliament had seen this film. They got up in parliament and asked about the missing children. Um, so it forced open the whole issue. And like you mentioned, that's online. But we want to do a sequel to it to talk about not just in the last 10, 12 years, how this whole thing has been covered up and, and you know shut down, but how this crime is continuing today. Because it's getting a lot worse in areas in British Columbia, the, the rate of native families going missing, the, the Chinese we found that the, the Chinese that are buying up a lot of the resources have their own private death squads that are forcing native families off the land at gunpoint. Uh, the RCMP and the Canadian government and the present prime minister is implicated in that. Um, and that should be an, ex, uh, an issue in the present election campaign in Canada, but nobody's mentioned it, of course, even though the evidence is being published all over. Um, all of that stuff we want to document in the, the, this new documentary film, but part of it is to interview me about, well, how has this changed you? Because the most interesting part of a, of a story is, uh, of a history is somebody's story, right? Um, how has it changed you? What conclusions have you come? And I'm gonna be talking about that. And I think, yeah, the spiritual path, which in a way is hard to talk about because it's so personal, right? Um, and yet it's, it's something that I think um, touches on some really important things because it has to do with how we really, if there's a chance to overcome this, these crimes and how they carry on, it's got to start with that personal awakening, right? Well, I do want to talk about that, and it is personal. But I think it's important because you're someone who has endured a tremendous amount of personal pain, personal sacrifice. I can only imagine the dark nights of the soul that you've gone through. And I want to take it outside of a Christian context, unless you want to add it back into that, because we're really talking about a, a deep spirituality here, where we all are forced to confront those deep questions of who we are, how, what is our relationship to whatever other forces there are in the universe. What was that like for you when your whole world was falling apart? And then how did you find the strength to kind of go forward in such a profound way? Yeah, I'll leave Christianity out of this because it's kind of like George Bernard Shaw said, Christianity sounds like a wonderful idea. Somebody should try it sometime. Yeah. Um, so I'll move on to more basic things. Um, the, um, uh, well, in a nutshell, the way I put it in some of my recent books is the truth of this is that I did die. I, I, it was not simply trauma. My whole life was uprooted and part of me died. And I think um, losing your children, going through constant poverty and attacks and just seeing everyone around you step back. Um, step back from us. you, step back from supporting you. Right. And uh, how easy it is to make people do that. Even the ones who love you and the ones who say they're going to stand by you and the ones who wouldn't back off, they simply killed. There was, uh, I wrote a book called Fallen about four of these guys, native guys in Vancouver who would not abandon me and they were all killed. And medic, uh, lethal injection or uh, beaten by cops in Vancouver, beaten to death. And 
you know, it's, it's when you live in that every day, when you're living in a war zone, uh, there's another part of us, if you don't collapse entirely, there's something else that starts rising in us. And it's, it's, it's something that can only be present in adversity. It's really interesting because uh, in the good times, you don't experience this, this strong part of us, this, this immortal part, I think, this part that can't be broken. It only steps out in the hard times when you, when not just a hard time, like poor me, look at what's happening to me. But no, if you're in a righteous cause and you have to be there, you will find the strength and protection. It's like classic example. I was living, I eventually was living out of my car. I was homeless, um, saving up the few bucks I had a week to see my children, you know. Um, and I had 20 bucks left. I'm walking down the street, Hastings Street. It's a core part of Vancouver where I did a lot of my work. And there's an entire homeless family just sitting on the sidewalk, okay? A native family, nothing. So hell, they needed the 20 bucks more than I did. So I give it to them. There, all right. Uh, about an hour later, I'm walking down the street and there's another 20 lying on at my feet, right? And it happens that way. That's just one example. But whenever I would go out on a limb and just keep going, boom, there's support. Support comes. and you have, but the more you think about yourself, the less that's there. You've got to be focused on what's right, what other people need. And I kept thinking, I am not going to let these bastards get away with this, right? They're not going to get away with this again. I just won't. Every day I had to live without resolve. And after a while, you just find there's a different person. There's a different identity that grows up in you. And it's certainly not the way that I was 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. You change. I mean, we all change over a lifetime. We, we have many lives if we're on the right path, I think. What was it like sitting with and experiencing the pain of others? Because I think that's something else that if we're really going to be honest, most of us shield ourselves from. And you didn't. So those, even early on, those people who came up and bore witness on the pulpit that had to crush your soul. You continue to put yourself in those situations where most of us would just go, you know, I don't want to really hear about that. And then when it comes to satanic ritual abuse, I, God, I don't want to hear about that. I'm sure that doesn't exist because I can't even imagine that. And then like you said, oh, I can imagine, oh, some less than human person, but really a, a nice kid, just like my kid that's happening to in some part of uh, Vancouver or Washington, wherever southern california i don't even want to go there and you go there over and over again i was about to say that um when i was in the church and people would get up and speak from the pulpit it shocked me but it didn't rock my world yet because it was still abstract it's only when i lost my own children and i saw how the church brutally took my children from me then I began to be open to the fact that they might have hurt other that could have killed children because i saw what they did to my own children and me so you need a personal experience to hang it on, right? And then your heart opens up. So I was able to relate to their pain because I was going through the same pain of what it was like not to see my kids every day and, and to be vilified and attacked and impoverished. And it's like, just because I was talking about things they didn't, you know, the, the perpetrators didn't want to have heard, right? So you need that personal experience to go to to get, develop real empathy, right? What about beyond that? Because you've gone much further. I mentioned satanic ritual abuse, which immediately is going to shut a lot of people down because they've been conditioned to think that that can't possibly be true. It's satanic panic. It's all the rest of this stuff that if anyone investigates, they find that it's that's not the case, that it is a reality. How do you get there? You haven't experienced that. You haven't. Oh, but but you've somehow opened yourself up to that and incorporated that in. But I'm particularly interested in how you understand that spiritually. And I mean spiritually in the broadest terms of who you are. Well, I've had experience when I was a minister in Port Alberni, I took part in an exorcism. And then I conducted other ones. I've done three in total. And um, including one outside the Vatican 10 years ago now. Um, and now what's interesting about that is I had, I had it. I came face to face with something and it's very difficult to try to put into words, but it confirmed me with the reality of this, this evil um, and how it operates through people, how it subverts and controls people. 
And Howard reaches out all the time to try to do that to all of us, right? And how we need to be very self-aware and vigilant all the time, especially when you're doing this frontline work, right? So um, that helped, you know, to have had that experience, but ultimately there's nothing, how can you even imagine, you know, these, these verified accounts of ceremonies where children are ritually raped, uh, tortured, chopped up and cannibalized. That's part of the ceremony. And there's a strong similarity between the black mass, satanic mass and the Catholic mass, because it's believed in both rituals that you're literally eating flesh and blood, whether it's the flesh and blood of Christ or the flesh and blood of an innocent child, that flesh and blood will redeem you somehow. So it's a, it's not a, a, a big stretch to go from one to the other. And that's why so many satanic rituals tend to be held in Catholic churches. It's the same energy uh, of, of predatory vampirism, really. How do you understand that? How do you understand uh, evil? So here's my thing. Like, so you were confronted an entity in this extended consciousness realm that you identified with being evil, right? So we get that. We've heard that too many times to ignore it. But you are a spirit. Do you accept that you are a spiritual being as well? I mean, that. Yes. Yeah, okay. And that there's a, a greater part of your spirit that isn't in that same realm at the same time that you're down here. Maybe that's too much of a stretch. But I guess what I'm trying to understand is how do you reconcile that with the light, with um, what you're here to do, with positive things? I, I always have a problem with trying to wrap my arms around the evil thing and truly, really try and understand it. Mm -hmm. And I always put it in this as below, so above thing. You know, if we want to find evil, you found it all over the place down here. And the fact that you found it at the Vatican when you did the exorcism is further confirmation of this as below, so above. Now you've spoken to how to transcend that, but I was wondering if you have any more thoughts on what is your personal understanding of how you're supposed to grow in the face of that kind of evil? Well, why is it there for you? What, what is it for you to, how are you supposed to transcend that? Well, don't forget that I, we ra we're raised in a culture where we oppose light and darkness all the time. And we tend to project our own shadow or our own light onto others. And we have to be aware of that. And the reality is light and darkness are part of the same phenomenon. Good and evil are part of God. And the reality is that, you know, there's day and then there's night. We're not afraid of the night unless you're just a child and you don't know any better. Um, that evil, for example, men who did this to me, who took my children from me, who were uh, destroyed my name publicly, who prevented me from working, all of this stuff, I was tempted to hate them for their hypocrisy and, and the evil of what they had done. And then I realized, but wait a minute, it's because of them that I'm in my situation now. Um, the, the quote, evil people are, are unwitting allies. Uh, you know, uh, in uh, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, they say, uh, be thankful for your enemy, he shows you who you are. And it's true, there's this kind of dance we do where um, we are sharpened, we're made clear by our interaction with what we call evil. Um, and so uh, I, it's not so much I see it as an enemy, but a different aspect of, of humanity that, if it's out of balance, can cause massive destruction. Um, now, I don't want to trivial, I don't want to make it too abstract, because in practice, the evil people do is horrible, especially when it's aimed at children. It's, there is a force that operates through us that seeks our own destruction, that seeks our debasement and our corruption. I believe that. And there's also that force in us that's resisting that, that is rising, that encourages us to rise up to our true higher self, right? And that's a war inside every soul, right? I mean, we're, we're all facing that, that, those two forces all the time. But I think it's a matter of knowing how they can also assist each other. And um, I mean, you know, it's, it, it's something that everyone has to experience in their own way, but um, it isn't that the whole notion that we're good and they're bad, that's what's causing a lot of the problem in the world because, um, well, you know, it, like I got a, my, my grandmother gave me a poem once when I was really little and it said, um, 
There's so much good in the worst of us and so much bad in the best of us that it isn't right for any of us to think better than uh, the rest of us. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. No, I, I, do not, I do know what you mean. And I think that you did a nice job there of saying, kind of articulating the struggle that we all face because yeah. we do have to take a stand and, and say there is a moral imperative. There is a good, there is a right or a wrong. There is yeah. no kind of morality isn't just an abstraction because we all experience that in our own heart. We know what's right. We know what's wrong. Even if we understand that we don't always make the right decisions and none of us do. So, yeah, but it, it's like an example too, is like at, at deathbeds, right? When people are dying, think is death evil? No, it's part of life. It's a normal process. And yet how people relate to it. Like I saw this all the time in Port Alberni when native families have a death, Everyone would mourn that be that all the families would get together. They'd be screaming, they'd be wailing, and then it was okay, right? You bring in a white family, and they're all in denial. They're saying, "You'll be up and around next week, sister." Like I was with a family whose the, the the mother was dying of liver cancer. She was only in her thirties. Her husband was saying, "Don't worry, you'll be up and around. The prognosis is good." I said, "No, you got to tell her the truth. It's it's the end. You got to say goodbye." And they hated me for saying that. They wouldn't talk to me after. Because that, you know, they felt that hurt them by telling the truth. It's kind of like now what I do with all of Canada or the world, right? They hate the truth teller when there's so much pain, but at some point they have to accept that it's over. And I use that as a metaphor for like the work we all do, because yeah, our society is over. I mean, this society, like it's coming down in many ways and we have to look at that and accept that death. That's not an evil thing. That's as necessary. If we're going to transform, go beyond it, right? Yeah, I'm not so sure. And, and, and we could get off on, on that whole thing. And I, I think that there's, there is another side of that in the same way that we talk about co conspiracy and how things get co-opted. And I'm always very suspicious of all the messages out there, but the, the death cult uh, environmentalism thing, I think is kind of a misstep. The end of the world thing, I think is kind of a misstep. The collapse of society, I think is kind of a misstep. I'm totally uh, energized by your activism and your ability to kind of continue to, to carry on in the way that you do. But I don't necessarily have to sign up for, uh, for all the rest of that stuff, but that's oh, okay no, I, too. I, I, I didn't mean, I wasn't trying to say an end of world scenario. I'm just saying that it's clear to me every day on the ground that the society that produced this genocide, it, 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 it can't sustain itself because it's, it's, so, um, it's so soulless and so corrupt that there's got to be this other, and I see this other force rising all the time to replace it. It's this dance going on, right? And we have to right. stand on the side coming up. Absolutely. But we also have to let go of what needs to fall. And that's hard for people because we all have a vested interest in the system to some degree. Right? So, I mean, it's, it's a dance, right? It is a dance. I, I do think it, it helps. And that's one of the things I like about your work. And even when we talk about some of these extreme things that people are going to have a really hard time accepting, like I said, it's a ritual satanic abuse kind of thing. We'll talk about the pedo pope in a minute. People just can't go there. But that's why I think you have to go. Because the other thing you're saying is is so gray and people can have legitimate differences of opinion about it. Like whether you tell someone, you know, my wife who's a forensic psychologist was just sharing with me a story. I think she'd watched in this documentary. This is kind of the opposite of your story. She said in, in Japan, if they receive news from a medical doctor that aunt Jenny is, is dying, they would never tell that person that never tell that person. And as a matter of fact, they would kind of orchestrate this myth around it of just, no, no, everything's going to be okay. And sometimes things are okay. <laughs> and sometimes you can justify that maybe there's some kind of placebo effect going on there too. Or maybe that's in right. the hands of some force that's beyond us to reinforce what is sometimes a very hokey and corrupt medical system that is very much into this mechanized idea that we have figured out all the stats on your entire thing too. So all that's a gray area. What isn't a gray area to me is Pedo Pope. You've done an unbelievable job of documenting 
uh, ongoing. So uh, that's one of, the, one of the things I want people to understand about your work. And if they go to murderbydecree.com, they'll find your ongoing investigations of things that are happening today, 2019. And again, you are a living history to connect those with this conspiracy that you've now at this point completely documented in a way that is kind of undeniable and you show that it's even acknowledged, quote unquote, acknowledged, that's an important history because you stand there saying all of that. So let's talk a little bit about the, the, the pedo pope because you have some new work on that that I wasn't aware of that I think is very important. You can start anywhere you want and talk about what you know about the pope that a lot of other people don't well, know. Two things. Uh, first, it should be pluralized. It's not one. It's popes. <laughs> Good point. Uh, also, Good point. Also, uh, pedo, the word itself, you see, we all know about programming through words. And um, the word pedophile means friend of children, right? Every time you use that word, it's designed to minimize and make it seem benign. Very so, good point, too. Just call it what it is, you know, child rapist, child killer. Um, but anyway, that's here we are. No, 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 no. Let's let's let's. You're you're spot on, and I think yeah. you've made that point in other cases. Of language is super important. Softening, uh, co-opting language is super important. Okay. I didn't mean to diminish it. Of course, I also wanted. We also had to have to add a little bit of lightness to this, if we <laughs> if we can, to kind of drive it into people. But you're right. It's the the rape, torture, murder exploitation in film uh, that they do. They snuff films and all that stuff. So it's the worst of the worst. Yeah, well, I mean, if you're talking of the present guy in Rome, right? Bergoglio, Jorge Bergoglio? Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, he was brought in as a spin doctor after we forced Ratzinger to resign in 2013. Uh, you know, his history is horrible. If you look into what he did as an archbishop in Argentina during the Dirty Wars, um, public relations guy for the junta, uh, turning a blind eye when his own priests were being tortured to death, trafficking children of political prisoners, which is an old practice in the Catholic Church. They did it in Franco, Spain um, for a lot of money. And his involvement with the Ninth Circle Satanic Cult, which has been attested to by eyewitnesses who were there, including people, sources within the Dutch royal family, because the present queen of the Netherlands, Maxima Zoriega, is an old friend of his. She's from Argentina. Her father was in the junta. Um, according to Alice Sturr, who's a journalist in the Netherlands who's been working in our network, she found out that Bergoglio and her had been in a relationship for some years, and uh, she's been paying him money for a number of years uh, in an Argentine bank account. Now, um, in other words, this guy's just as dirty as all his predecessors, but he's got the public relations smiley pope image. But it's funny how the mass slips with these guys. Like, remember, he was in America a few years ago. And all of the time that he's posing as this nice liberal progressive pope, um, he goes out to uh, gives a talk about Junipero Serra, who was a Franciscan missionary who personally worked to death thousands of Indians on his plantation in California. And Bigolio turns, he has a beatification ceremony. He makes this guy a saint. And he says, we are inspired by his zeal in killing off thousands of non-believers. So even with the liberal element of the church, they still all believe the old line that you should kill off non-believers. That is, they're not human beings until they can become baptized. Therefore, they're, they're cannon fodder for however we want, right? And it's, it's endemic in the, in, the, in the mindset. So the appearance, the hand puppet is one thing, but the reality is the same. It's the same entity, right? And, um, and that's kind of how I approach this whole thing of, well, it doesn't one element in the church that's bad. It's the nature of the beast to be doing this, right? These crimes against children. Well, I think we need to speak to all of that in a couple of ways. I mean, one, from the beginning, it's always been about control first and foremost. And then all evil kind of springs forth from that, but it's, it's about controlling people. Then I think we've already talked about the Christ consciousness that you're not... Uh, you're not averse to the idea that there is a light that shines somehow shines through all this and that Christians who find a spiritual uh, awakening in themselves and then associate that with their religion, 
that's not a problem, but it may not be the source of it either, if you know what I mean. So people do have genuine spiritual transformative experiences inside of the Christian church. I think what you're saying, or let me just say what I'm saying, but that doesn't mean that the organization isn't fundamentally corrupt and fundamentally serving a different purpose than what most people think it is. And I, that's the only way I can understand the dichotomy of what we see, because there are good people in the church. There are people of a, of a good heart. There are people that are trying to listen to the voice inside their head that wants them to do good. Maybe you want to speak to that a little bit since I gave a little rant there. Well, there were, there were good Germans. There were good Germans too. If you want to, if you want to look at them individually in isolation from the collective that they're part of, yeah, there's good people all over the place. But if you step back and look at. I'm saying something different though. I'd like to hear you just comment on this. Do you believe that people have spiritually transformative experiences? And do you believe that those spiritually transformative experiences can be through a spiritual being that they understand to be Christ. And the reason I say it that way, the reason I question it is, you know, I've done 50 shows on near-death experience where people not only say they had this experience, but their life is witness to that. Their life changes in dramatic ways and they do I, things and all the rest of that. So is that real? I can't, I, I, well, I can't judge whether it's real or not. I can't look into another person's soul and say, you know, I know what they're going through. I don't have the religious belief that one person can do that for another. Um, but um, put it this way, uh, Frederick Douglass, the slave, he, he led the abolitionist movement. He, he, in his biography, he describes how his slave master had a religious conversion, became a Methodist, born again Methodist. So he expected the slave master to then release all the slaves. And no, he became even more brutal because he had God on his side. And if you have a genuine spiritual thing, why do you need a church? Why do you need a religion to express that? You don't. It's, it's the kingdom of heaven is within you or it isn't. And if it's within you, you don't need to express it on Sunday in the church, right? Well, I mean, true, true. But, but people can, can both be true. Can, I mean, look, I'm not a Christian. <laughs> I'm not religious. So I'm kind of playing devil's advocate here. But I do, I do encounter a lot of people who, when they encounter this information, the kind of information you're talking about, are confronted with the, the, the kind of impossible option of turning their back on a tradition that is so interwoven in their family and they, they just can't do it. And I do have some empathy for them that, that, they, that they, they have a real experience there that they're trying to understand. And it might take them a while to do it. I've been a minister. Uh, I've worked in, in churches. I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, the majority of my parishioners were there because it's a social club, it's a way to reassure people. They've always done it. It's a sentimental family kind of thing to do. Okay, that's fine. Like a social club, fine. That necessarily and Christianity, belief in Christ, tends to get in the way of that. You know, if because it's just a spiritual calling is very personal and it it's not part of a group. Uh, you know, the old saying the um, Quakers have a saying: God gets lost in a crowd, and I think that that's true, right? Um, so no, I don't believe the idea that of religion is an is a imperial idea that everybody has to have one belief. That's coming out of the Roman Empire originally. Uh, the Catholic Church is an expression of the Roman Empire. Even the terms used for popes, it's in terms of the old emperors. I mean, Pontifex Maximus, you know, uh, like all of this stuff. So there's a history there, but it boils down to a simple moral and legal fact that if you're part of an institution that's committing crime, it doesn't matter what your spiritual beliefs are. You're part of a crime. You're putting money in a collection plate. You're associated with them. You're an accessory to a crime. So we say to people, what does that have to do with the spiritual calling? You can't be part of that if you're a moral person. Forget about spirituality. Let's just talk about morality and ethics. Are you really going to be associated with, with these churches that have centuries of blood on their hands and are still doing these crimes? I mean, I don't think any moral person would do that. And so to me, it boils down to that, not spirituality, right? I think you're right, Kevin. I think you're 100% right. Do you want to speak to the idea that this is a problem that's been concentrated in the Catholic or limited to Catholicism and those darn Catholics and that stupid Pope? 
you know that's not true from your personal experience, but where does it go? Why, why do all the religions, you, you have a great, some great stuff on the Mormons. Great, when I say great, of course, I mean horrific, but you know, and, and, and again, just so people know, so I started re reading some of your stuff on the Mormons. I mean, like, I got to fact check this guy. I got to fact check this guy. He's probably going too far. And again, it takes 15 minutes and the sexual abuse trials in Bountiful, Utah that directly connect the current prophet leader of the Mormon church with the worst kind of, worst kind of crimes against children. Again, same kind of stuff, rape, torture, murder, all that kind of stuff. It's there. We can't draw the lines completely, but we've all seen the stories to to seen the connections too too many times now that the burden of proof is on those folks to show that those connections don't lead where they seem to. But I went on and on there. This isn't just about Catholicism, right? No, I mean it was a source of a lot of this stuff. Uh, Catholicism means universal and that's why i don't like to use the term i mean it's it's part of the mindset um but of empire but um yeah a lot of the stuff started in rome and it was replicated by others there's a strong connection between the mormon church and, and the church of rome um they even opened a mormon temple not far from the vatican now and we believe the nine circles rituals are going on there we have eyewitnesses who brought children who saw children being brought in from macedonia in september and never came out again of that Mormon temple in Rome. So we know that stuff's going on, likely. Um, and on my shows, on the BBS radio, on Hugh Stan, my show, if you go back in the archives, you'll see two interviews with insiders who were there in the ritual killings under the, the temple in uh, Salt Lake City. And even more horrible stuff, you know, um, what they did to people. But um, the reality is, is, no, it isn't just the Church of Rome, but whatever however expresses itself it's coming from the same spirit which is of domination and, and control and um it's interesting the the mormon church i believe was set up as a social engineering project uh they the fbi and the cia recruit disproportionately out of mormons um it's a very when you talk to the people there the mentality the control they have over people is unbelievable they all have to wear a certain underwear I don't know if you know this, it's like the Mormon underwear. And they believe if you take it off, you're damned. It, it, it's like it's so controlled, the thinking. And um, you, you don't have to trace it that far to see the link between the MK Ultra mind control experiments in the 50s, the strong ties they had with various religions in, in not only getting test subjects, children, but these programs because within churches, because religions are prone to this. People have handed over their judgment and authority to another figure, somebody who knows better than them. They defer themselves. They live in a vicarious condition all the time where somebody else is thinking for them and is there, um, the one to make the judgments, not themselves. So it's, it's like a slave culture and a culture of silence. And that's why it's hard for these stories to come out. But that's the, the problem. It, you know, the most obvious example of it is it coming out of Rome and has for many centuries. But it's, it's really that spirit. Um, which is degradation of the human soul, really. It's, it's designed to captivate and enslave humanity, I believe, right, from on the ground. You know, uh, as we kind of move towards wrapping things up, you just said a lot of really very important things in my world kind of that I wonder about. And that is, it's almost like you sketched out these two ladders, you know, that are leaned up against these two evil walls. And the one ladder is a ladder that we kind of understand. It's climbing the wall of dominance, control, empire in a way that, hey, we have to be protected against whoever, you know, the Huns that are going to march over the hill. And there's a reality to that because that is our, that is our history as well. Whatever that reality is, we all acknowledge that there's a reality to the fact that we give up some of our rights to our government in order for protection. I don't want to go too far with that because we can tear that apart. But there's another ladder and it's leaning against a completely different wall. And it's the wall that you're alluding to when you talk about the entity maybe that you encountered in your exorcisms or the entity that wants yeah. things 
for reasons that really don't make any other sense in that they just uh, move us in some dark ways that we totally don't understand. And then we have the intersection of those, the, the, the MK Ultra, the impossible kind of, you know, how can you do those crimes? It's like the Holocaust thing. How did we do those crimes? How did human beings do those crimes? And, and so what is that relationship between those two forces, one that we understand, or we think we understand, and one that is beyond our grasp for the most part? It's a mystery to some degree. It's like when you encounter real goodness and real evil um, are not describable. They can only be experienced. And then there's a mystery around, there's an ambiguity. When, when, okay, when you're in love, okay, you can't describe it to somebody, it's there. It's life-giving, it's beautiful, there's nothing like it, right? Similarly, when you're encountering, when you're in the depths of despair brought about by this evil, uh, there's no way to understand it. You can't understand these things. It's beyond an understanding, but the heart has its own understanding, right? And, and ultimately, our minds can deceive us because they're conditioned, they're programmed, they're influenced, but our heart mind doesn't. That consciousness within our own heart and soul doesn't ever betray us. And that's why I say to people, like, before you start this work, you've got to do your own personal work and every day go there because it's your only defense against what you're going to go up against. You know, and and, um, and I find that, um, you know, all the time you have to do that. Do you want to speak to that for a minute? What is your practice? How do you how do you go there? Well, for how me, you open that, how do you open that way. heart? You, you're you're a man. Program. You're a man in the Western culture, which we're kind of programmed from the beginning to keep that damn thing closed. Yeah. Um, and, and then you've had to endure this kind of ongoing, you know, you reference Sun Tzu a lot. Uh, you're a warrior, man, uh, the, uh, the ultimate truth seeker warrior. And now you're speaking that you need to kind of let your, take off your armor and open your heart as part of your, 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 your just being, your spiritual path. The, I how about, do you do that? I, I, sit, I sit in nature. I sit by running water. I just remember who I was as a little boy running around in love with everyone in the world. I mean, it go back to our innocence, right? And um, when I uh, lost my kids, I'd see them now and then, but I dropped them off on Sunday night and it was a very bad time for me after I dropped them off. So all I'd do is get on the bus and I'd ride around and be with people. And we have that commonality. You know, I, I often say to people, there's more genetic variation in one troop of chimpanzees than the entire human race. We're that close. We're really the expression of that one soul. And you feel that when you're in great grief, you go to people, you hang out with them, you just absorb their energy and watch the way they are. And you take great solace in that. So we don't isolate. I say to people, the last thing you want to do is isolate in the room, isolate in a life, um, thinking that a counselor is going to help you. Um, you know, when I, I tell that famous story of, of William Coombs, um, the native guy who, when we occupied the church, he was there with us, even though it was torture, like, he heard the chant sound of a church bell, he'd start getting sick because of the way he'd been tortured in these places. Yet there he is in church with us the day we occupied it. And I said, William, how could, and he was really happy. He was handing out flyers to people and he had no fear. He wasn't afraid of these priests. And he said, I didn't want to let you guys down. I didn't want to be left out. Right? Now that, that love, that desire to be with us, we did that. We helped heal him that day, not some counselor, but all of us together showing we're not afraid of these people. We're not afraid of the truth. We're going to stand here and help and love each other in practice, right, where it counts. And that he stopped drinking that week. That's bloody miracle, you know, if you knew his situation. Um, but we did that miracle together. And that's, to me, I, you, you reconnect with that common blood heartbeat. And, uh, and you find that in nature everywhere. You know, I mean, it's Kevin, beautiful. it's amazing. Your work is amazing. Um, Murderbydecree.com, again, is the place for people to go to stay up to date. You can not only check out the book and order the book, but it's updated constantly with new goings on. And I love your show. Here we stand on BBS radio. Lots of good stuff. Not a lot of filler, just like hidden with more and more stuff, new stuff all the time. And then I do hope people check out uh, Unrepentant and good to know that there's a follow-up to that. What else can you tell people about in terms of what's coming up for you? Well, uh, 
you know, I'm just finishing off. Uh, we've been part of kind of a uh, election campaign in Canada to put forward the idea of the republic, which a majority of Canadians like. They want an end to with the British crown and that. So, I mean, there's been that occupying me. But come um, uh, the new year, we're starting a whole new campaign. I'll be on the road doing not just speaking uh, to groups, but actual conducting training workshops in common law, um, especially in the states where we ha actually have our biggest support in America, because people already get this idea to a large degree. It's already, you're raised with the idea that, you know, you're sovereign citizens or republic, you're not some subject somewhere. So I'll be in the states. Um, people want to reach me. It's the common land at gmail.com. Uh, love to do another interview with you. You're a great interviewer. Um, getting into the marrow of stuff, which I really love. So thank you, Alex. Appreciate well, it. Well, that's nice of you to say. I feel like, you know, on some of these shows, <laughs> I get overexcited. And that's how it is. I've been, I've been diving into your stuff. And I'm just, I struggle with how to present it because I think it's so important. And I'm such a fan of you as a person. And I, I just think there's a million stories that you have to tell. And it's just been great having you on. And yeah, I I'd love to. Time. Well, I'll, uh, thank you again. We'll talk more. Thanks again to Kevin Annette for joining me today on Skeptico. The one question I'd have to tee up from this interview is, do you think Kevin's story is true? I mean, this is just another podcast, 400 and whatever in the series. Is this possibly true? Mass murder of Indian kids in these schools that they forced him into? Satanic ritual abuse long standing in the church and going on today. Collusion between church and state in order to commit crimes against children and crimes in general. This is a broad reaching conspiracy that would seem to reach every part of society and culture. Could this possibly be true? Let me know what you think to that question. And please let me know if you have any other information I should know about. I say this all the time, but you guys, you listeners of Skeptigo have been the source of everything that I know on this show. So we have to keep that system going. And the best way for you to do it is to connect with me, comment about the show, uh, join the Skeptico forum, which you'll find from the Skeptico website, and let your voice be heard there and share your ideas with other people. This show was very important to me, very meaningful in so many ways, and I'm so grateful to Kevin and the work he's doing. If you found this show important, please share it with anyone else you think needs to hear about this. Like I always say, this show reaches the people it's supposed to reach. So if you want to be part of that process, I certainly invite you to do that. I have a number of interesting, interesting shows coming up. Please stay with me for all of that. Until next time, take care and bye for now.